وبالآخرة هم يوقنون أولئك على هدى من ربهم وأولئك هم المفلحون إن الذين كفروا سواء عليهم أأنذرتهم أم لم تنذرهم لا يؤمنون ختم الله على قلوبهم وعلى سمعهم وعلى أبصارهم غشاوة ولهم عذاب عظيم رب الشحل صدري ويسر لي أمره وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم ما بعد once again everyone السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته there are uh, inshallah our intention today is to move on from ayah number five onwards but there are a couple of comments from the fourth ayah that I wanted to share with everyone that I think are very important the first of them is about the sequence of the things Allah mentions in that ayah there are three pieces وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ and those who believe in what was sent down to you that's a reference to the Qur'an وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ and what was sent down much before you and that's a reference to Torah and Injil and Zabur, previous scripture وَبِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ يُقِنُونَ and then finally the only next thing mentioned is and, if, and in the afterlife they have absolute conviction there are actually three points, not two, that are very important to mention if this was going chronologically first came the earliest scripture then came the final scripture, then comes the afterlife. So chronologically you would have had وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَبِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ يُقِنُونَ That would be a chronological sequence. But Allah Azza wa Jal purposely broke the chronological sequence, mentioned the last revelation first, earlier revelation, so he goes back into history in وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ and then goes back to the future with وَبِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ يُقِنُونَ So you notice that he broke that sequence, right? Now this serves an important function. There are, this is something you have to keep an eye on when you study Qur'an. Sometimes Allah will put in order, and everything is in order except one thing is pulled out. So in this case actually, Qur'an has been pulled out of sequence, and Qur'an has been put first. Otherwise everything else is in order. But Qur'an has been taken from the middle actually to the very beginning. And this suggests something. It suggests that even though, let's say somebody in Medina used to be Jewish, or they used to be Christian, and then they became Muslim later on. Obviously their first Iman was not in the Qur'an, their first Iman was in what? It was in Torah, it was in Injil, that's what they believed before. The Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, you know, the, the, New Te- the Gospel you know, uh, given to, to Jesus, this is what they believed in. And then came along their belief in the Qur'an. Now the thing is, the thing you believe in first, or your early exposure, it's kind of like glasses you're wearing, and it it sets the tone for everything else you're exposed to, right? So you see through that lens. For instance, those of you that are raised as Muslims and you learn some things from your parents, consciously or subconsciously, those are a part of your Islam. And everything else you learn about Islam, you build on top of what you already kind of know. You don't question it. Like most of you, if not any of you, you've never looked up why you pray three raka'ah for Maghrib. You just do it. Your parents taught you how to do that and you kept doing it and now you... You've never looked up what's the dalil for three raka'ah in Maghrib. And why are we silent in the third raka'ah? You don't, you don't look this up. It's just part of your religious consciousness and the tradition moves forward. Now the same thing with our books. These people who believed in Torah and Injil, you would imagine that their religious affiliation, their connection to Allah is first based on what foundation? Torah and Injil. And then comes the Qur'an. But Allah Azza wa Jal breaks even the subconscious sequence and says no. Now you cannot look at your experience with Torah and Injil as primary. You must learn to rethink everything from what? The Qur'an. And instead of looking at the Qur'an in light of the Bible, you will look at the Bible in light of the Qur'an. So the Qur'an will actually come first, even though chronologically it's last. It'll now come first and it will determine what you will accept or reject from the previous scripture. You understand? So it put the Qur'an in this what, what, the, what Allah Azza wa Jal himself, himself calls muhayminan alayhi A guardian, a watcher over the other scripture It watches over the other scripture So you're gonna read, like if you study the Hebrew Bible now I don't recommend it if you don't have background But if you do study the Hebrew Bible, you'll notice You'll read a lot of things about Musa, Moses, or Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam Or Isaac, or even Jesus in the New Testament You'll read things that you just cannot accept You just can't accept them. They'll say things about those same prophets that we love and believe in, and you will imagine they must be talking about somebody else. 
Because the kinds of horrible things that have been said, for instance about Nuh alayhi salam, you can't even imagine for a terrible human being, and they're casually said about them. So the amount of changes that have been made are so horrible, and there's so, so many on so many fronts. And the biggest of those changes I mentioned yesterday, the biggest of those changes is Akhirah is almost completely removed. One of the most fundamental pieces of our faith, the afterlife, what is going to happen to a human being after they die, is gone from the equation almost entirely. Almost entirely. And so what does Allah say? Now you will look at Qur'an. And in its light, you will accept or reject what you find in what was revealed before you. And then as a result, your conviction in the afterlife will become strong. Otherwise, if you rearrange the sequence, you know what happens? What happens is, well, the old scripture, it didn't talk about the Day of Judgment so much. Even actually somebody emailed me yesterday after listening to this lecture online and said they asked a Jewish friend of theirs, a very conservative Jewish friend, do you believe in the afterlife? And they told them straightforward, actually, it's not a big deal in our religion. We just focus on making this world a better place. That's a flat out answer. And then yet others emailed and said, we've asked our Jewish friends and even rabbis all the time, you know, do you believe in an afterlife? And the most common answer we get is we're not sure. That's the common answer even today among Orthodox Judaism. Can you imagine? And so if you were to put that first and then come to the Qur'an, then you'll get the kinds of rhetoric that you find among some modern academics who say, well, the Qur'an must have invented this story about an afterlife because it's really not an emphasis of the Bible because for Orientalists and Western academics that study the Qur'an, to them it's not munazzal bin Allah, it's not revelation. It's a byproduct and plagiarized from the Bible and the, old, you know, the New Testament and the Old Testament and it's bits and pieces of things. So they say, well, the creative thing in the Qur'an is this... Uh, afterlife business. So we got to find some other references that can justify how the Qur'an came up with this stuff. But that's because they're looking at the Qur'an as secondary and they're looking at all what came before it as primary. Allah reverses that from the very beginning. Your study of the Qur'an must put Qur'an first and every other scripture second. And this actually determines something very powerful. We are not to look at the Bible, the Old Testament, the stories in the Torah and the stories in the Injil, for example, and the rulings found in them, whatever is left of them. Whatever is left of them. It is, by the way, still of value. It's still valuable. And it's still something of benefit for those who are going to study comparative religion, for example. And it's also important to understand, like I was telling you in my first session, when the Qur'an came, it was talking to rabbis. It was talking to priests. And those people have a certain mindset already. So it's important to understand what was in their head when Qur'an spoke to them. You know, if I understand that you have a certain kind of background, then I will speak to you at your level. You understand? So Allah Azza wa Jalla spoke to them knowing what they know in the past, in the history. So it's important to compare how the Bible talked about the story of, you know, one thing, oh, David and Goliath, for example, famous story in the Bible. Later on in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah will talk about it. So when we get to that, we will actually compare how the Bible talks about it and how the Qur'an corrected it. Not that the Qur'an, we're going to learn details about the Qur'an from the Bible, but rather the parts of the Bible will be proven true by the Qur'an. And some of the details that go along with the Qur'an we're, we're able to accept. Okay? So this is actually the approach to the relationship between these two scriptures. That was an important thing to mention. The second thing to mention is the, the word yuqinun is very interesting. Uh, the word yuqinu, for those of you that are familiar with tasrif, is actually mazid fi. It's if'al. Aiqana yuqinu iqanan. Okay? And it actually means to be convinced absolutely. It does mean to be convinced absolutely. But there is another alternative in Arabic which is yaqina. Yaqina also means to be convinced absolutely. Yaqintu al amr ta'akkadtu minhu. I made sure of it. So Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't say, Wabil akhirati hum yaqinun. He says, Wabil akhirati hum yuqinun. And the, the, the principle in Arabic is, Ida takassara lavd. When you spell with more, the meaning enhances. And when you put words in that particular spelling structure, iqan, what that suggests is they have absolute, complete, and whole conviction in the akhirah. Their belief in the afterlife has now been completed. Because if'al suggests something tam. And so the idea here that bits and pieces about the afterlife were given before, but now that you're looking at it through the lens of the Qur'an, all of those gaps has, have been filled. What exactly is going to happen to human beings when they're raised? What exactly is going to happen to them? How are they going to be judged? On what basis are they going to be judged? What is going to happen? They, you know, uh, I used to study comparative religion and comparative philosophy in college, not because I was religiously interested, because I thought it would be an easy A. So I used to study that stuff. Fascinating stuff. 
And they, you know, uh, the Christian theologians, one of the biggest problems they had was, what is going to happen to all the people before Jesus? Because they believe, you know, through Jesus you go to heaven, right? But then the Bible talks about good people before Jesus. So they're like, well, where are they going to go? And they start asking that question. And they, different philosophers in Christian history attacked that problem differently. They came up with all kinds of theories like purgatory, like the elevator is stuck between heaven and hell for some people. And they're just going to, they're about to go to heaven, like people like Abraham and Moses or whatever. They're about to go to heaven, but the elevator gets stuck. I say, well, sorry, you didn't go through Jesus, so hold on a second, let's, let's consider this. And then Jesus is going to have to come, and they're going to have to go through him. <laughs> they had to make all this stuff up, because they couldn't reconcile how the akhirah is going to work pre-Isa alayhi salam, right? The same problem happened with the Jews. A lot of Jewish philosophies about what's going to happen in the afterlife. No clarity. You know, the Muslims can have... Disagreements on lots of things. Should we raise our hand before we go into Rukur? You know, should we pray 8 Taraweeh or 20 Taraweeh? We can have disagreements. We should we have local moon sighting or global moon sighting? But you know, one thing we don't have disagreement about is what's going to happen on Judgment Day. <laughs> There's no disagreement about what hell looks like and what heaven looks like. There's no disagreements about this stuff. It's absolutely clear. Because it's so very fundamental. And for them, this is the stuff where all the confusion was. This is where all the confusion was. I even read back in the day, certain Jewish philosophers and scholars who believed that heaven is basically when God kills all the non-Jews. And the only one left are the Israelites. And that's actually what else is there to heaven than that. And that'll be heaven on earth. You know? And a lot of them didn't even believe in a resurrection. And some that do say it's not really that important. Right? So this, this sequence clarifies that. And the use of the word iqan, absolute complete conviction, illustrates how important the subject is in the Qur'an. And this is again, even to this day, non-Muslim scholars of the Qur'an, Western academics, this is one of the biggest problems we ha they have with the Qur'an, even now in their circles, is the discourse on the afterlife. Why is the Qur'an so emphatic on the afterlife when neither the Old nor the New Testament are nearly this emphatic on it? Now, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, أُولَٰئِكَ ala hudan. Oh, by the way, one last thing about the previous ayah. So important. So, so important. There are... In, in interesting, in previous prophets, you know, in previous scripture, this happened also. There has always been people that claimed to be a prophet, and they were not a prophet. They claim to be false prophets. And they don't say they're false. They say that they're a prophet. They get revelation, but they don't. And anybody who claims that ends up getting a cult following of their own also, right? And so even within the Christian tradition and the Jewish tradition, that used to happen and it still happens. Like the Mormon church, for example, right? The Book of Mormon, the guy believes that he receives revelation and he's a prophet after Jesus. And his book is also an addendum, an addition to the Bible. right? So now, in, even in the Muslim tradition, you had even right after the passing of the Prophet ﷺ, Musayr al kadhab And you had others who claimed to be prophets. They started making ludicrous poetry and saying, this is our Qur'an. And they added to the religion, or tried to add to the religion, and they were obviously made a joke out of, they were annihilated. But even to this day, there may be individuals, groups, philosophies that suggest that there are prophets after Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And I don't need to, in this lecture series, I don't want to pick on groups and tell you which group says what, because that's, we're here to study Qur'an. Not here, I'm not interested in the creativity of other groups. But I will tell you the way in which the Qur'an protected from that first generation onwards until the Day of Judgment, no room for any other messenger or any other revelation. How did the Qur'an do that? Allah says in the beginning, this Qur'an is guidance. For who? The people of Taqwa. And the second characteristic of the people of Taqwa, they believe in what was sent to you. What is that? Qur'an. And what was sent much before you, which is? Torah and Injil. If there was any room to believe anything else, there would have been, وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ بَعْدِكَ And what, what is going to be sent? Or وَمَا يُنزَلُ مِنْ بَعْدِكَ What's going to be sent after you? There's no need for that. The only thing to believe after this book is akhirah. وَبِلْ أَخِرَةِهُمْ يُقِنُونَ That's the only thing left. So when somebody says, how can you prove there's no other prophet after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, open up the first page of Baqarah, dude. It's right there. All you have to believe is what was given to him and what was given before him. But there's no mention of what is going to be given after. It's done. End of story. <laughs> you don't have to go anywhere else. Allah Azza wa Jalla solves this, what is considered to some people a very profound problem, so simply and so conclusively. Because the only big thing left, by the way, the coming of a prophet, a small matter or a big matter? It's a huge matter. The Jews used to wait for the final messenger. The, Jesus, the followers of Jesus are waiting for the return of Christ. 
But for the Muslims, the only big matter left to believe in is the Akhirah. That's the only major event left. And that's why between the Prophet ﷺ and the Day of Judgment, he would even describe them kahatain. He would say, me and the hour are like these two fingers. Because those are the two big you know, calls to faith left for humanity. Believe in the last messenger, and then the only major event left is the Day of Judgment. That's it. You know? Which is, look at this exact concept in Surah Al-Rahman. Allah Azza wa Jal describes, Allah al Quran. Yeah? He taught, he taught the Quran. And then the only thing left after that is when you know, the, the, the skies and the tree are going to fall into sajda, which is some argue a description of judgment day. You know? Ashamsu wal qamaru bi husman wal najmu wa shajar yashjudan. You know? When, and other places in Quran describe the trees are falling, the stars are falling, the, you know, the, the mountains are getting leveled. In other words, it's the Quran and then the day of judgment. That's it. These two things are going to come in very quick succession in respect to human history. So this is, these are two important considerations just coming out of that fourth ayah. Now, أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَىٰ هُدَمْ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ What a gift from Allah Azza wa Jal. If you don't look carefully, you might think this is a, already redundant. Allah already said it's guidance. It's already guidance for people of taqwa. He says those people are committed to guidance from their master. أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَىٰ هُدَمْ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ An easy translation suggests, and those are the ultimately successful people. Those people are the ultimately successful. Beautiful things here that we need to understand. The first of them is, why is the word hudan, for grammar students, why is it nakira? And why not ala al-huda min rabbihim? Wala ala hudan. This is actually like Al-Kashaf mentions, law absartu fulanan, la absartu, law absarta fulanan, la absarta rajulan. They use the nakira as if to say they are committed to what is truly, truly guidance. That is guidance like no other. In, Ar- Ar- in Arabic language, when you put the nakira or tanween, hudan, the double accents, on a word sometimes, that's done for what's called tafkhim, to make something grand. That is what you call guidance. In other words, looking at previous scripture only in light of the final scripture, and having conviction in the afterlife. That is ultimate guidance from their master. وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ And those are the ones that are going to attain final success. The word aflaha, very interesting word. From it you get the word fallah. Fallah is a farmer. But aflaha also means al-fawzu wal-najat wal-baqa fi naimi wal-khair. Falahu dahr baqa'uhu. One of the other meanings of the, the word falaha is baqiya, to remain. And muflihun are the ones who are going to allow themselves to remain. In other words, they're going to have eternal life. They're going to have a life that lasts forever, full of success and blessings. This word doesn't just mean successful. If you only want to talk about purely just success, you say fa'izun. Quran uses that too. Ulaika humul fa'izun. But when you say muflihun, you're referring to people who are successful who will always remain successful. It's also referring to, I told you, the farmer, because they say, falahtul ard, shaqaqtul ard. It's the, when you, when you, you know, dig into the earth to pull out the crop when the crop is ready. The idea is a farmer works the entire year. He works hard on the soil. He puts the seed in, he puts the water on, he doesn't see any results most of the year. And finally the crop grows. And when it finally grows, in every society in the world, when it's harvest season, they have festivals. And they have parties and celebrations. Because unlike your job, your job you have a check every other week. Some people have a monthly check. But a farmer doesn't have a weekly check, no bi-weekly check. When does a farmer get a check? Once a year, once a season. Once in a season. So that season, when they're about to pull the crop out of the land, that's the one time they're going to get their paycheck. That, that, at that occasion, they're actually called fallah or muflih. At that time. What is Allah suggesting by use of this word? He's not just suggesting permanent and eternal success. He's suggesting people will have to do a lot of work, and eventually they will reap what they sowed. They will eventually pull out what they did. In other words, the entire philosophy of Islam, of the religion, the wisdom of the religion, that you will have to work hard to earn Allah's mercy and Jannah. It's not just Allah will grant it to whoever He wants. On top of that, you're going to have to put your work in. And it's only then that Allah Azza wa will let you see the fruit of your labor. That's already captured in Ula'ika humul muflihun. Now, something that is to me probably the most beautiful part of this uh, uh, this ayah, this, the lesson that comes from this ayah. I'd like to remind you that when Allah said that the book is guidance for the people of taqwa, al-muttaqeen, He mentioned two groups. One group was, I'll repeat, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ That was the first group. The first group is they believe in what they can't see. 
they establish prayer and they spend basically the second group was walladhina yu'minuna bima unzila ilayka wa ma unzila min qablik wa bil akhirati hum yuqinun they you know they believe in what was sent to you what was sent before you and they have conviction in the afterlife let me simplify that even further for you the first group is anybody who has faith and does good deeds what are the basic good deeds praying and helping people what allah calls in other places iqamat salah and ita'a zakah isn't it it's just those two things you have to believe in allah and be good that's the first ayah, basically. But the next ayah is actually about people that are knowledgeable about the scripture. They're knowledgeable about the Qur'an, they're knowledgeable even about the revelation that came before them, yes? So you have two groups of, two different groups of people. One group of people, uh, let's put it in our times now, there's a taxi driver, poor guy works like 19 hours a day to survive with his family. He has no time to study the religion. He never got a chance to learn the Arabic language or study tajweed or fix his maharij or get an ijazah or study hadith or nothing. He barely gets time. He pulls over by a masjid. He makes salah, goes back into his cab and you know, earns his money. That's what he does. Six days a week, seven days a week. The one day that he's got day off, he's basically in a coma. He's passed out and his kids are running all over him. Right, that's his life. And then on the other hand, you have somebody who Allah has opened up the opportunity for, maybe his family sponsored him or her, and they're studying Qur'an, they're studying Sharia, they're studying the deen, they're traveling from one land to another to learn, right? And then they're going to do a, a bachelor's degree from some Islamic university, then a master's, then a PhD, they're becoming a alim on top of a alim on top of a alim. They're both believers. But you would think for your, to yourself, you know, the people who know more, and the people who are getting to do all this learning, they must be better people than the cab, the cab driver is lesser, and the alim is better. And notice in the first ayah, it's everybody. Anybody who believes in the unseen, anybody who prays, anybody who spends. It's open to the general public, yeah? And the next ayah, they believe in this revelation, in the previous revelation, it's almost like an indication about people who are knowledgeable in scripture. But then what Allah does in this ayah, is he bunches all of them together and hands them a certificate of success. And he says, أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَىٰ هُدًا مِّن رَبِّهِمْ the, All of those are committed to guidance from their master. Though one of them should not think because of the position Allah has put them in, because of the situation Allah has put them in, that they are any less in the sight of Allah because this door to learning and the door to seek more knowledge and the door to become a alim or whatever else, this is a door that doesn't just require that you open a book and read. Allah has to provide you, know, you for your, your rent and your food and your expenses and your family. Those things have to be taken care of so you can free up and do this. You can't just do this and say, Allah will feed my family. You can't do that. And some people spend their lives just earning enough so they can barely feed their family. That's all they do. And they are also valuable to Allah so long as they can hold on to their iman. So long as they can just believe in the end, establish the prayer and then give. If they can commit to those three things, that is in and of itself valuable to Allah. And actually for those who have gotten a chance to learn, those who Allah opened the door for, whether they got to take one course or two courses, nowadays in, the, in America you get like weekend courses. People have the luxury of taking a weekend course to learn Islam. That's a luxury. You have the luxury of having a phone with high speed internet and you can just log in and watch a video whenever you feel like and you can choose the, the topic too. You don't have to go to your local masjid and say, that's the halaqa, I guess that's what it is. No, you can pick the topic too now. And then you can pick the scholar you want to learn from and you can pause them and slow them down or rewind them or switch to some other topic whenever you feel like. We are living in luxury on top of luxury when it comes to learning. But if Allah has opened the doors of learning for you, then understand one big responsibility that falls upon you. Your job it becomes to facilitate this learning for the people for whom Allah did not open that door. For the people that are super busy. The people that don't have any time. You have to be the one that have to make that convenience for them. Instead of looking down on them, look, they don't even attend the halaqat. They don't even learn. They don't even join the universities. They're too busy making money. No, 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 no. Your job it is, instead of waiting for them to come to you, you now have to go to them. You have to facilitate for them. And that becomes a responsibility within your family, within your community. For all of you that are learning the deen in whatever capacity, that you have to become of service to the people around you. Now, uh, you know, I did mention, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ these, these are the people that earn eventual success. You will notice from the very beginning, Allah keeps on highlighting that people who believe in the previous scripture, and now finally this Qur'an, 
they have to have absolute conviction in the next life. Akhir, yuqinun was mentioned. Even al-muflihun is an ishara, an indication towards this, this concept. As we go forward, you'll notice the subject is about to change. These ayat that we just studied up to the fifth ayah, they were entirely focused on people who believe. Now there are going to be two ayat whose focus is the people who don't believe. People who are actually on the opposite end, the, the worst of the disbelievers. And before I get into them, I want to share with you something about the beauty of the speech of Allah. Five ayat were dedicated to the believers. And the first of them is actually from huruf muqatta'at. But subject-wise, what you can understand, the second ayah, third ayah, fourth ayah, and fifth ayah. So we started with, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدَى لِلْمُتَّقِينَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ That's the third one. And the fourth one, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ وَبِلَا خِرَتِهُمْ يُقِنُونَ And then the last one of these, أُولَئِكَ عَلَى هُدَمْ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Now notice something. The first of these ayat began with guidance. How did it begin with guidance? ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا The last of these ayat ends with guidance. What does Allah say? أُولَئِكَ عَلَى هُدًا مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ And the both of the ayat in the middle, both are about iman. الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ so huda and huda is in the beginning and the end. Guidance and guidance at the end. And iman and iman in the middle. It's a perfect symmetry even. Within this, within this small set of ayat is again the perfection and symmetry of the kalam of Allah. But what I wanted to highlight is not just the beauty of that, but another dimension of it. At least comparing the huda in the first ayah, or the second ayah, and the huda in the fifth ayah. If you re listen to the first ayah again, just a rough translation. This book is guidance for who? Hudan. للمتقين, for the people of taqwa, a question arises. It's not for everybody, it's only for the people of taqwa. I thought it's guidance for everybody because way later on in the same surah, when you get to the ayah of Ramadan, Allah says, Hudan lin nas. He says, Guidance for who? All people. So now there seems to be a contradiction at face value. On the one hand, the Quran is saying, This is guidance for the people of taqwa for the people who are conscious and careful. And on the other hand, it's saying it's guidance for all of humanity. How do you reconcile these two things? You know, I tell you one thing, this is actually a very important consideration in language, and this is why the Quran demands pondering. It demands reflection. You can't just read it at a surface level. Because Allah creates these questions in your mind as He speaks. And you have to reconcile them to understand His intent. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at it this way. The Qur'an is a message, is it beneficial to all of humanity, yes or no? Absolutely. But who are the people who are actually going to take the time to take the benefit? The muttaqeen. This, somebody goes to college, they take a course. The professor says, this book is beneficial for all of you. It's going to benefit all of you. But then he adds, but in the end, it's only going to benefit the serious ones among you. It has benefit for all of you, if you so choose to extract the benefit. It is hudan lin nas, an open invitation, if you so choose. But Allah in the end comments, but the only ones who actually end up taking that benefit, benefiting from that guidance, is the people of taqwa. You understand? So it's like, as though Allah is saying, all of humanity has an opportunity to become muttaqeen. All of them have a chance. You're, by default, you are nas. But if you really want to get ahead, you should try and become from the muttaqeen, Allahumma ja'alna minhum. Okay? Now we get to the ayat on the opposite end of this, which is, inna ladhina kafaru. No doubt those who have disbelieved. The Qur'an is very sensitive to context. It is an incredible, incredible study. There, the, one of the tragedies of the Qur'an is that we look at it in a shallow way. The phrase says, no doubt those who have disbelieved. And people assume that when Allah is mentioning no doubt those who have disbelieved, He's referring to non-Muslims. He's referring to those who are not Muslim. And what's He going to say about the non-Muslims? He's going to say, sawa'un alayhim. This is a statement. It doesn't even matter for them. It's all the same as far as they're concerned. أَنذَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنذِرْهُمْ Whether you were to warn them, meaning Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa If you, even the messenger, were to warn them or not warn them, or never warn them. Whether you warn them or you never warn them. لا يؤمنون they're not going to believe. So the bottom line of this ayah is, those who are non-Muslim are just not going to believe. They're, they're a lost cause. Is that true? 
Are there not non-Muslims who come to Islam every single day? How is Allah saying, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا And after the istinaf, but the basic sentence is, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Those who have disbelieved are not going to believe. And if you, and there's an inna in the beginning, there's no doubt about it. Those who have disbelieved are not going to believe. How was this ayah understood originally and even in its context? The first thing, I'll read some things from you from tafsir. صِيغَةٌ لِلْجَمْعَ مَعَلَامِ التَّعْرِيفِ وَهِيَ لِلْإِسْتِغْرَاقِ بِظَاهِرِهِ ثُمَّ إِنَّهُ لَا لِزَاعَ فِي أَنَّهُ لَيْسَ الْمُرَادِ مِنْهَا هَذَا الظَّاهِرِ Imam Razi, Imam Kashaf, Ibn Kathir, so many people comment along the same lines. They say that Allah used the plural here, those who've disbelieved. And it seems as though it's talking about all of those who disbelieve. If you didn't pay attention, that's what it might seem. But there's absolutely no disagreement in all of our intellectual history that this ayah is not about all disbelievers. It's not about all who don't believe in Islam. It's not laysa dhalik. And then he says, even gives an example. He says, إِنَّ النَّاسَ يُؤْذُونَنِي Don't you all, sometimes you say, people have hurt me. People have hurt me. Are you saying all people on the planet have hurt you? Or some people? You mean some people, but you don't say that. You just say, people have hurt me. You know? Or sometimes I'm frustrated and I walk out of class and say, students are stupid. Am I referring to all students on the face of the earth? Or am I referring to a particular class that was behave, misbehaving at a particular time? But even though I am, at that time I'm going to use general language. You understand? And this is actually a way of expressing someone's frustration. Allah Azza wa anger is manifest because He says not just, you know, inna sinfan min al kafirin, a special group among the kafirin that I'm talking about. He says, alladhina kafaru. He speaks about them in this angry tone, those that have demonstrated disbelief. That makes no difference. And so read this from Ibn Kathir rahimahullah, innahum ru'asa'u al yahud, al mu'anidun, alladhina wasafahum Allah ta'ala bi annahum yaktumun al haqq. One opinion among even the Sahaba existed that this is referring to the heads, the, the leaders of the Jewish community who were the worst in their opposition that Allah described later on that even though they know the truth, they rejected it anyway. This is what Ibn Abbas Even Ibn Abbas, Mufassir of Qur'an says this is not all disbelievers. This in his mind is actually leadership of the Jewish community in Medina. That's what it's referring to. It's important to understand that. Because when you just read translation of the Qur'an, the question comes in your mind. Allah has basically written off every non-Muslim. It's done. End of story. This is when you don't take the entire context of the book. The historical context and the textual context. Now understand the following. There are two groups that are, that are very critical to distinguish. Those who have disbelieved are already in Makkah. Quraysh. They disbelieved so badly that they were even willing to kill the Prophet. Yes or no? And Rasulullah barely escapes Makkah and makes it to Medina. So when the Quran says those people are a hopeless case, understandable to an extent. I won't fill that blank yet, but to an extent, that's understandable. The second group of disbelievers Allah is referring to in this ayah are people in Medina who are actually, like Ibn Abbas correctly points out, are from the Jewish community. They understand the message of the Qur'an, they've internalized it, they actually recognize even everything Qur'an is saying like they would recognize their own children, and yet they have become the worst of the enemies, and they're even collaborating with the enemies of Islam in Makkah. They're working with them. They're also alladhina kafaru. And they have, they have made up their mind. But these two kuffar are different categories. The kuffar of Makkah and the kuffar of Medina are two different categories. And it's really important to understand the difference. The kuffar of Makkah, did they know about revelation before? No. So when they rejected revelation, when they rejected the akhirah, when they rejected iman, then they rejected it based on ignorance and arrogance. Well, the kuffar of Medina, did they know about revelation before? Yeah. And they didn't even spare their own books. They even did kuffar of the akhirah in their own books. They did even kuffar of the prophets in their own books. How are they expected to spare Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? I mean, they already hate him on account of the fact that he's not even from their race. There's already a racism there that becomes manifest. But even before then, what did they do with their own books? Quran will comment, Baqarah will comment on how they dealt with their own scripture. And so when Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا in this ayah, they've demonstrated kufr not just in front of the Prophet, they've demonstrated their disbelief not just in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they have been demonstrating disbelief from before. 
They've already rejected much of this from before. So when its confirmation comes, it's no surprise that it didn't even matter whether even you warned them or not. They're not going to believe. They're set in their ways. And it really bothers them what they took so much effort to erase from their books. The Akhirah. They took so much effort to erase it. And Qur'an keeps hitting them with it, and hitting them with it, and hitting them with it, until the point where in Surah Al-Baqarah, later on, what's he going to say? You know, يَوَدُّ أَحَدُهُمْ لَوْ يُعَمَّرُوا أَلْفَ Each one of them wishes they could live a thousand years. Why? وَمَا هُوَ بِمُزَحْزِحِهِ مِنَ النَّارِ أَنْ يُعَمَّرُ He's not getting away from no fire, even if he gets to live that long. I'll still get you into your Akhirah. Because <laughs> they're trying to avoid that subject, Allah hits them harder and harder with that subject. So it's, that's why it's important to note the language of this ayah. Allah says, أَنذَرْتَهُمْ Whether you warned them or not. The Prophet doesn't just warn. He gives good news, he teaches, he preaches. أَدَعَوْتَهُمْ أَبَشَّرْتَهُمْ أَعَلَّمْتَهُمْ There's so many verbs possible. But when you say warning, what is warning referring to? Warning refers to punishment. Warning refers to consequences. And the ultimate consequences for believers are when? In the Akhirah. And so this is, it's just perfectly structured, the, the language of these ayat, referring to those who have denied the Akhirah. I'm reminded even of Surah Bani Israel. It's also called Surah Al-Isra, a Makki Surah, which from the beginning talks about the Jews. And there, Allah Azza wa says, on the one hand, إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَمْ وَيُبَشِّرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يُبَشِّرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ صَالِحَاتِ أَنَّ لَهُمْ أَجْرًا كَبِيرًا وَأَنَّ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ أَعْتَدْنَا لَهُمْ عَذَابًا أَلِيمًا When talking in the context of the Jews, even Allah then said, this Qur'an gives good news to those who do good deeds, but warns those that have, you know, uh, and, and tells those who don't believe in the afterlife that they'll have painful punishment. So that point will not be let go easily in this, in this discourse. Though the meanings of, now let's go back to the Meccans for a second, a very important point for all Muslims to understand. I told you the Meccan people, they were the first recipients of the Qur'an, they received two-thirds of the Qur'an, the Prophet spent a huge part of his life with them, even before becoming a messenger So these people, you can say, had the best opportunity to accept the religion of Allah than any other nation on the face of this earth. And yet they still were willing to kill their own messenger These are the worst of the worst of the worst of the criminals. So when Allah says, those disbelievers, they're hopeless. La yu'minun, they're not gonna believe. It's understandable. But you know what baffles me? What shatters me completely? is that when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam went finally back all the way to Mecca. After leaving Mecca, the first time he came back all the way to Mecca was you know, several years later at the instance of Hudaybiyah. This is about six, seven years later, he comes back to Mecca all the way to make Hajj peacefully. And even then, they tried to attack him. They actually attempted assassination against the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And they failed in that attempt. And now the Muslims are heated. And then Uthman radiallahu anhu, after lots of negotiations, goes inside Mecca to try to sort out things. But he's held, he's basically under house arrest, and a rumor is spread that Uthman radiallahu anhu has been killed. When the Muslims came for Hajj peacefully, no harm intended, and now their ambassador has also been killed. After an attempt has been already made on the life of the Prophet ﷺ, now the Muslims are ready for war. And the Prophet ﷺ took an oath from them that they're gonna fight. But then they were really ready to fight to avenge the death of Uthman radiallahu anhu. But then Uthman comes walking back into the camp. He's okay. So the fire comes down. But the, the reason I'm highlighting that to you is an ayah came down that turned my world upside down. It turned my world upside down. They were about to walk into, they were about to attack Mecca. Who are the people of Mecca? I've already told you. The worst enemies of Islam the ones who received most of the Qur'an, the ones who drove their messenger out, they deserve no opportunities. And they should be waged war against. What does Allah say? وَلَوْلَا رِجَالٌ مُؤْمِنُونَ وَنِسَاءٌ مُؤْمِنَاتٌ لَمْ تَعْلَمُوهُمْ أَن تَطَعُوهُمْ Man. Allah says, had it not been for believing men and believing women that you have never known, that you have never known, that live in Mecca, that you would have trampled all over him. An ugly stain would have hit you without you even knowing. You would have ended up killing believers. 
What is Allah saying? In Mecca, the enemies of Islam, even within their families, somebody quietly became Muslim, never told anybody. Quietly praying five times without, maybe even just with their eyes. They don't even, they don't even dare to make sajda in front of their family. But they believe in Allah. They've left shirk. But they never told anybody. They never migrated with the Prophet ﷺ. They never joined Badr or Uhud or Ahzab or anything else. But they became Muslim. And Allah calls them, and there are men of them, and there are women of them. And they've never declared their Islam to anyone out of fear of being killed. So even the Muslims don't know that they're Muslims. Even they don't know that they're Muslims. And when the Muslims were about to attack Makkah, Allah says, by the way, one of the reasons I didn't let that attack happen is because there are secret Muslims inside Makkah till now that you will never know. You will never know. لِيُدْخِلَ اللَّهُ فِي رَحْمَتِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ So Allah can enter into His mercy whoever He wants. Why am I telling you all of this? Even in a clear-cut case like Makkah, where you can say the people of Makkah are kuffar, Allah will never guide them. They deserve punishment. You can write them off. Even then, all the way by the end of the struggle of the Prophet ﷺ. These are the last two, three years of the struggle. Even then, Allah says, there might be somebody who Allah will enter into His mercy. And there are those who might believe. So the point of all of this is when you read, الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Those who have disbelieved in the Qur'an, it is context-based. And most of the time, it is referring to very, very bad people. It is not referring to just any non-Muslim. It's referring to the worst of them, who have been the most stubborn. And they don't want to budge from their position. Whether you warn them or not, they just don't want to hear it. Who's being held responsible in this ayah? They are. They are being warned, and it didn't even matter if you warned them or not. They are completely stubborn in their ways. Those are the people Allah calls, الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا That is not a light term in the Qur'an. That is not a loving term in the Qur'an. When Allah Azza wa calls someone a kafir, He doesn't... This is the, one of the worst words you can use for somebody. There are people, you know, in the first ayat, they were the believers. I like to think of it as they are, that's the group of believers and potential believers. That's believers and potential believers. People who have taqwa and they haven't even come to be exposed to the Qur'an yet. There are people who even, they were Christians, they were Jews. They came to Islam later. And when they came to Islam and they took their shahada, Qur'an records their testimony. You know what they said? They said, Inna kunna min qablihi muslimin. We were already Muslim before this. Quran says, before their shahada, they were already what? Muslim. Because they were potentially Muslim. So Islam was always in their hearts. So when we see the word Alladina kafaru in the Quran and we oversimplify it and you know, mean it to extend to all non-Muslims in every context, that is a very serious problem. That's not even something the Sahaba were willing to do. Even the Sahaba said, this must mean the, the heads of the Yahud who are the most adamant against the deen and things like that. We oversimplify this issue and when you oversimplify this issue, lots of problems happen. Like the first problem that happens is somebody becomes Muslim and their family is non-Muslim. And he says, I worry about my family. And they're told, by the way, in the kafaru sawa'un alayhim. Andartahum am lantunvirhum la yu'minu. Don't worry about it, man. Whether you give them da'wah or not, they're not gonna believe. Leave them alone. You know? You can't love your mother anymore because she's a Christian. You are duna man had Allah. Allah will you'll never find a group of people who love those who oppose Allah. Your mother is a Christian, she opposes Allah. You shouldn't love your mother anymore. What kind of nonsense is this? What kind of poison are we giving people? Is this what our deen teaches? This is, the, this is such a disservice to the book of Allah and to that history. These are the people, Ibrahim salam doesn't love his father? He doesn't love his father until the very end, until Allah tells him to leave? Until Allah tells him to not make istighfar anymore? Nuh salam doesn't love his son? And for 950 years, all this time he doesn't love his family? Until the very, very end when Allah had revealed to him, that's it, now he's not your family. Why didn't Allah tell him that a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, five hundred years ago? What kind of preaching is this? That you tell people that because you're a believer, you have to have hatred for non-Muslims, even if they're in your family. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And it, again, it, this is, how is the deen of Allah going to spread to humanity? If anybody who accepts Islam cuts themselves off from those who have not yet found the faith. All humanity was given the gift of guidance. Adam salam was told, when guidance comes to you from me, to your children, all of them, the Hindus, the Buddhists, the atheists, the Jews, the Christians, everybody, 
and their only connection to guidance is the Muslims, and the Muslims are supposed to hate them? Why is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa standing when a Jewish funeral is walking by of a girl? He stands up. And the Sahabi says, it's a Jew. Why are you standing up? And he says, it's not a child of Adam. It's not a child of Adam. To dignify humanity. When Allah says, لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam, We honored the children of Adam. Yes, the mushrikun were humiliated. Yes, the kuffar are hated in the Qur'an. But not all kuffar. Not all kuffar. The worst of the enemies of this deen. Those that have demonstrated hatred and poison against Islam, we stand tough against them. And even against them, the second they take shahada, فَإِخْوَانُكُمْ فِي الدين. In a split second, the guy who you used to hate looking at his face is your brother in deen. I was at the peace convention a couple of years ago, and that Swiss you know, politician who used to spew poison against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he took shahada. The guy who was against the minarets in Switzerland, remember that? That guy took, I met him, I met the guy. He took shahada, and he brought his son to the conference. And in the conference, his son took shahada. فَإِخْوَانُكُمْ فِي الدِّينَ This is the same person, if you saw his YouTube video two, three years ago, the Muslims underneath, may Allah curse him, Allah will throw him in hell, he's gonna burn, he's gonna, you know, that's what we're saying. And what does Allah do? Allah takes that same person, that same Umar before Islam, and he turns him into an Umar after Islam, right? That's what Allah does. We're, we're twisted when it comes to this stuff. We're really twisted when it comes to this stuff. I have 15 minutes left, I'll get to the next ayah quickly inshaAllah ta'ala. And that is khatam Allahu ala qulubihim. Allah has placed a seal on their hearts. The word khatam is one of the two words in the Qur'an used for seal. Another word used is taba. Taba Allahu ala qulubihim. The taba al nahar they say when a river fills up to the brim. It can't take anymore. And then like for example you have this uh, bottle or bottling company. The bottle fills up completely with liquid. If you fill any more, it'll pour out and then when they cork it up, there's no more room for anything. That's called taba. To be completely filled. At taba bi ma'na al mala or awil imtila. To fill up completely. But khatam is not the same as that. Khatam is used in a number of ways. Khatam is used for the seal on a ring or a stamp. Khatam is used back in the old days before email and before typing or anything else, people used to hand write letters. And if it was classified, they would put it in, a, in an envelope and then they would put thin, you know, melted wax on top to seal it. That seal was actually also called khatam. You don't seal the letter until the letter is completely done writing. Yes? So the idea behind khatam Yajuz and Yaf al Hadal Khatam Bihim fil Akhira. One of them actually no, that's not what I wanted to read first. I'll tell you the, the, the linguistic meanings first. Al Khatmu Hakikatuhu Asad al Ina. The origin of the word is actually to put a lid on a container. Like you're boiling rice or something and it's done and you don't want it to go cold or something, and you put a lid on it. It actually doesn't mean that it's filled. It just means that it's cooked. It's completed, but it's not filled to the top. You don't need to do any more, anything that it could have done, it's done already, now you can just cover it. That's the idea. You didn't need to write any more on the letter, you're done writing what you had to write, and then you put the lid on top. Figuratively, khatam is used when something is a done deal, there's no more work needed, necessary, and that's when you put a khatam. Allah says, khatam Allahu ala qulubihim. Allah placed what is roughly called a seal on their hearts. We know what that means? That their hearts have demonstrated all the goodness that they could have exhibited has been exhausted. They didn't exercise any of the good Allah put in their hearts. There's nothing left to show. And so Allah decides there's no more reason for them to, to, to give them a chance anymore. Allah has placed the seal on their hearts. By the way, I emphasized in the previous ayah, they were stubborn. You remember that? Allah never seals anybody's heart until they exhibit stubbornness. Allah doesn't just randomly decide this one's heart is sealed and that one's heart is sealed. Allah will throw in hell whoever He wants and throw in Jannah whoever He wants. No, 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 no. People are actually responsible for what they do to their hearts and then eventually Allah allows it to happen. You know, um, one, of, one of the great teachers of, of Qur'an nowadays, uh, uh, Muhammad Ratib al Nabulsi, may Allah protect him and preserve him, Syrian family, you know, um, his, in his lectures he would say something really cool. He says, you know, a car is supposed to run on gasoline and you put cooking oil in there and you put some you know, salt in there and then it doesn't run and then you say Allah didn't want it to run. This car was made to run a certain way. 
If you don't operate it the right way, then yes, Allah didn't make it run, that's because you're stupid. You're right, at the end of the day, Allah made it not run anymore. It is, it is Allah, musabibul asbahm. But He didn't just do that without some divine intervention, lightning struck and the car stopped running. You made it stop running. You didn't get diabetes because Allah sent an angel injecting you with diabetes. You kept eating Swiss rolls all night, boxes after boxes. You did this to yourself. When human beings suffer consequences in this world, physical consequences, we understand that it is us that are to be held partially. You know, there are things beyond your control, but there are things, harmful things that happen to you because of you. There are people who don't watch their cholesterol, don't eat healthy, sit around and don't do any exercise, and then have a heart attack and say, Qadrullah, Qadrullah ma sha'a fa'al. It's Allah's Qadr, Allah is testing us. Go take a walk, man. Then you blame the Qadr of Allah. Where did you get Qadr of Allah from? The same principles that apply in the physical world. You don't take care of, a car, take care of a car, Allah will let it go bad. You don't take care of your health, Allah will let you get sick. The same principles apply in the spiritual world. When you don't exercise the, the strength of your heart to accept a good message, when you don't try and remember Allah, when you don't abide by Allah's law, when you keep on forgetting Allah, then Allah will, there will be consequences on your heart. At the end of the day, Allah will allow it to be sealed. If you want to show that behavior, if you want to be irresponsible, then you don't get to blame Allah. Khatam Allahu ala qulubihim, I would argue, is because these people were, they made it a done deal on their own in the previous ayah. And that's why Allah sealed, sealed it. Fine, have it your way. Be a terminal case. Then don't say, oh Allah is going to give shifa, you know, it's a stage 4 diabetes and you're still eating chocolate cake. You're like, Allah will give shifa. No, you've basically sealed your deal. Khatam Allah ala batnik, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you're a done deal, you're a closed case because you don't want to hear it but now just some things a little bit further about the idea of qulub what is in the heart? in the Quran, what do we learn? what emotions lie inside of the heart? the, the heart is the place of love when Allah places a seal on the heart they're incapable of loving what they should things that deserve love, they hate they're supposed to love the believer they start hating the believer they're supposed to love truth, they develop a hatred for the truth. They're supposed to love justice, they develop a hatred for justice. SubhanAllah. When the heart is sealed, there's, the heart includes mercy, rahma. But when the heart is sealed, rahma is gone. These people can say the most cruel things and do the most cruel things because the heart is sealed. The heart is the place of gratitude. Shukr comes from the heart. And when the heart is sealed, these people feel no gratitude. They feel no reason to thank anyone, and they feel entitled to everything. The heart is the place of fear, and when the heart is sealed, they feel no fear for any of the things they do. They have no fear of consequence. The heart is the place of hope. These people are completely hopeless. They have no hopes in the akhirah, no hopes in the good of anybody else. They don't even hope better for themselves. They consider everything fatalistic. Just do whatever you want to do and however you do it, because life sucks anyway. That's their mentality, they're hopeless people because the heart is locked. The heart is the place of guilt. Because when you do something wrong, Allah put a fitra in the human being, a nafsul lawama, you feel bad. But when the heart is sealed, you can do the most horrible things and still be proud of them. Zayyana lahum shaytanu a'malahum. That's when the heart is sealed. Shaitan beautifies their deeds to them. The heart is the place of shame, of istihya. These people have no shame left. When the heart is dead, then it doesn't matter how lewd, how vile, how vulgar these people are in their speech, in their actions, in their clothing. It won't matter to them. They'll actually take what, is, what Allah in the fitrah of the human being, in the nature of the human being made ugly, and they'll make it beautiful for themselves. The heart is the place for responsibility, a sense of responsibility. You owe responsibility to your neighbor, you feel obligation to your children, you feel obligation to your you know, spouse, your parents, etc. When the heart is sealed, you feel no responsibility towards anybody else. The heart, more, most importantly, I would argue, is the place of dignity. Allah Azza wa dignified people. You know? And the, the, the sense of dignity you get is in the heart. Like the, the respect you feel for your teacher is in your heart. You know? The respect you feel for Islam, for Rasulullah is in your heart. The respect you should have for yourself is in your heart. But when the heart is sealed, then there's no sense of dignity left. Not for others and not even for yourself. When Allah says that He sealed their hearts, this is no small problem. This is not just they're not going to believe. Everything good that comes from the heart is gone. Everything good, the entire fitrah of the human being locked away, stolen from them. SubhanAllah. This is not just talking about anybody who disbelieves. This is talking about vile, wretched people. And now, now so pay attention to the, the sequence. عَلَى قُلُوبِهِمْ He placed a seal on their hearts. And then he says, وَعَلَى سَمْعِهِمْ And on their hearing. 
the hearts were already sealed. So then the hearing, it didn't even matter what they heard. Because whatever they heard could never make its way to the heart. You know, there are people that when the heart is completely sealed, they hear something good and it almost bothers them. Because it's trying to break through a seal. <laughs> so they just stop. Let's, can we change the channel? Can we listen to something else? Can we talk, change the subject? I can't hear this. Let's put an, a seal on their ears. They could be in the best of gatherings. Everybody else around them is tears out of the love of Allah, out of the fear of Allah, out of hope and out of mercy. But they're the only ones that are like, when are we leaving? Uh, what, what are we doing here? No, nothing moves. Nothing moves inside the ear. Because the ear is directly connected to what? The heart. They're put next to each other in the ayah. You see that? The heart is sealed. And then what's, the, what's so surprising that the ear has been sealed? And then he says, وَعَلَىٰ أَبْصَارِهِمْ غِشَاوَةً And finally, on their eyes, there's a cover. That is to suggest they're blind. Allah placed a cover over their eyes. You know, when somebody is blind, it doesn't matter if you put a cover on them or not. سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ When they refuse to see the truth, when they refuse to see guidance for what it is, when they refuse to reflect on the world around them, the, this beautiful eyes that Allah gave us is so we can see Allah's creation and reflect. When you, you, when you fail to exercise that capability, then Allah will let you see the world, but He won't let you see the guidance in it. All the things Allah created around us, He says, فِيهِ آيَاتٌ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَةٌ In it, there's an ayah. The tree has an ayah in it. The sky has an ayah in it. The bird has an ayah in it. When the, when the eye is covered, then you'll see the bird, and you'll see the sky, and you'll see the tree. You will never see what? You won't see the ayah. You won't see what it points to. You just, you know, it's like you see the door, you never see what's behind the door. It's just blocked from you. This is, وَعَلَىٰ أَبْصَادِهِمْ غِشَاوَةً This, by the way, some argue is actually a scene of Judgment Day. Some have argued that this ayah is describing that when they are raised on Judgment Day, their heart is sealed, their ears aren't working, and their eyes are covered blind. Because other places in the Qur'an, Allah also mentions that they're raised blind. You know, and وَقَدْ كُنْتُ بَصِيرًا Oh, why did you raise me blind? I used to be able to see. They'll complain on Judgment Day. But the more, the more dominant ihtimal, the more dominant possibility is that in fact this is referring to in this world. Their incapability to accept guidance is depicted in this beautiful language. Now the last thing I want to share with you about this is you'll notice that there are these three things. The hearts are sealed, the, ears are, the hearing is sealed, and then the eyes are covered. But the hearing, sama, is the only thing mentioned in the singular. Eyes are plural. Hearts are plural. But hearing is singular, sam'ihim. It's so beautiful, the depiction of the Qur'an. You know, all of you are, for instance, hopefully looking towards me. Each of you is sitting in a different place. All of you have a different point of view or no? Everybody's at a slightly different angle, isn't it? Everybody has their own point of view. So it's not one view, it's multiple views. It's multiple views. Our hearts are all in the same state or different states? They're in difference. Qulub. Absar and qulub. Because different points of view and different states of the heart. Some hearts very eager to listen. Some hearts not eager to listen at all. Some hearts paying attention. Some not paying attention. It's all kinds of variations. But when it comes to hearing, are our ears experiencing exactly the same thing? Yeah. The ears at least. The sounds that go to all of us are the same sounds that are traveling. We're unified in what is heard. And this is actually the power of the Qur'an. It will hit all the different people of different points of view. It will hit all the people of different states of hearts. But the message itself is the same message. And the way it will impact them is going to be different. It's like the imagery of the rain. The rain is the same, but what it produces on the earth is so different. It's the same water, but it produces different life. It's the same thing we all hear, but the way in which it inspires us. For every one of you that are sitting listening to dars today, if you're pondering over these ayat, there's something different about these ayat that touched you than the person next to you. As you leave, or you, as, you, as we're praying and you're thinking about the ayat, you're going to be thinking about one jewel, one treasure from these ayat. And somebody else will be thinking about another treasure from the ayat, even though you all heard the same thing. But what made, their, made its way into your hearts is different. What makes its way into my heart is different. This is the powerful depiction of the Qur'an. So, you know, وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ And they have great, enormous punishment waiting ahead of them. Allah does not love to punish people. I'll conclude with this. I know I'm over my time, or I'm right on time, inshallah. Allah does not love to punish people. ما يَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ بِعَذَابِكُمْ What's Allah going to get out of punishing you? You know? Allah created human beings so He can show them mercy. 
but the worst and the most wretched of people do deserve, do deserve great punishment. And the greatest of all punishments, by the way, is already in the ayah. When your heart is sealed, there is no greater punishment. When your ears can't benefit from Qur'an, there is no greater punishment. And I would argue for the original people who heard these ayat, they didn't just have the opportunity to cleanse their hearts and purify their ears, they got to see the Prophet ﷺ with their own eyes, and they're still blind. Can you imagine? Of, the, of all the things you can see in this world, <laughs> that they get to see Rasulullah ﷺ, and they still got a ghishawa over their eyes, what bigger tragedy can there be? May Allah Azza wa Jal protect us from that tragedy. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.